Okay, uh, welcome everybody. How are you all doing this evening? I'd like to invite my fellow panelists to unmute their screens and come on board. We're excited to have everyone here. Um, and we'll just wait until we can see everybody. Hello. <laughs> Okay, uh, Gino, would you like to get us started? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to Black Matters, a teach-in on language, literature, rhetoric, writing, and verbal art. I'm Gina Chandler Smith. I'm an associate professor in the English department. My area of specialty is contemporary African American literature, and I'll provide a short introduction to this evening's program on behalf of the diversity committee that you see pictured here. So, the goal of this teaching is to demonstrate the interdisciplinary ways that the discipline of English and its subfields contained within our department interpret and engage with the historic and contemporary issues of what we're calling Black Matters. By Black Matters, we mean issues regarding identity, language, personhood, citizenship, art, communicated in all aspects and dimensions of Black life in and outside of the classroom. And our theme for this evening will be following the story and disrupting the narrative. So we will uh, engage with you tonight through several disciplinary areas in English. And I'm gonna give you a brief overview of those today. The first is literature. Um, the study of literature engages students in the many genres and periods of oral and written works of the imagination, exposing students to various cultures, movements, authors, and texts that have enriched the oral and written imagination over the years and across the globe. We'll then move to a discussion about linguistics. Linguistics is the scientific study of what we call natural language or language sciences. Here, students explore the structure of language, the social significance of language, and language's usage in a variety of disciplines. Then we'll move to rhetoric and writing. Rhetoric and writing focuses on theories of meaning making, as well as on teaching students to understand in their various situations, what we call various situations of symbolic action. And it also gets them to think about the intellectual work that they do that empowers them to make social change. They learn how to write according to various established principles and work environments. And they use that to sort of think through culture from a humanistic perspective. And then finally, we'll end with creative writing. Creative writing is a form of artistic expression in poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, drama, and the essay. And creative writers use the imagination to express the depths of human consciousness in their creative art, responding critically, symbolically, conceptually, and personally to their surrounding worlds and environment. So let me introduce our moderators for this evening. You've already met, but I'll introduce again, mm. our moderator, S. Moon Castanelli. He's an assistant professor of English who teaches classes in Asian American studies and ethnic American literatures. He also teaches classes in gender and women's studies. We also have some other moderators who you may not see on the screen, but who are working behind the scenes to make sure your questions are answered and, and handled smoothly. We have Dr. Justin R. Green, who's an instructor in the composition de department program, and Shelly Maycock, who's also an instructor of composition here in the English department. Now for our panelists. Our first panelist needs no introduction. She is the award-winning, world-renowned poet, educator, activist, Dr. Nikki Giovanni. Um, Dr. Giovanni has long used her literary gifts to raise awareness of the social issues, particularly those of gender and race, and we are honored to have her with us today. 
Dr. Virginia C. Fowler, professor of English, she directs the, the, uh, the undergraduate studies program in the Department of English. She also teaches in African American literature and women's literature, and she's written several books, including several book link studies on Nikki Giovanni. Dr. Katie Carmichael, who will head our linguistics discussion. She teaches classes in sociolinguistics and language and ethnicity, and her research particularly examines language variation in post-Katrina New Orleans. Dr. Sheila Carter Todd, Rhetoric and Writing. Dr. Carter Todd teaches classes in African-American and cultural rhetorics, composition theory, and pedagogy. Dr. Jennifer Santa Franchini, who's also in Rhetoric and Writing. Dr. Sano Franchini teaches classes in cultural rhetorics, Asian American rhetoric, visual rhetoric, document design, and feminist interaction design. Alexa Garboyle, who's a third year Master of Fine Arts candidate here at Virginia Tech. She'll be one of our featured panelists in the creative writing portion. And last but not least, Dr. L. Lamar Wilson, Assistant Professor of Creative Writing at Wake Forest University and a Virginia Tech Master of Fine Arts graduate in 2010. Dr. Wilson's documentary poetics have been featured in various poetry collections, um, particularly one that we'll see tonight, The Changing Same, his PBS documentary for the Point of View short series. And we're pleased to have Dr. Wilson with us today. So without further ado, I'll turn things back over to Silas. Silas? Thank you so much, Gina, for introducing tonight's really exciting event and our esteemed panelists. I'm just going to take a quick moment and provide some information about accommodations and accessibility. First, we've extended the event to 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to provide more time for discussion, so we won't be ending at 7.15 as previously advertised. Second, this teach-in is being recorded for the purpose of archiving it through the VT Library Special Collections and University Archives. This is a community public archive, which allows those who are not affiliated with the VT community to also access the materials from tonight. We're thrilled that there's been such a high interest in our VT English department teach-in. Over 900 people have actually registered for tonight's event, which is an amazing thing. Um, and so we've uh, taken it upon ourselves to make sure that this is also being live streamed through the VT Graduate College YouTube channel. While there isn't any live captioning or cart happening this evening, we've asked our panelists to create accessibility scripts and our team of moderators will be dropping those accessibility scripts into the chat box as the presentations go on. So you'll be able to visually read uh, some of what the presentation is covering. As we move through the presentations, attendees are welcome to add comments and questions. I can already see that the chat box has been really active. Um, our team of moderators will do their best to organize your submissions. Please remember, we're all participating with different levels of knowledge and experiences, and our chat and Q&A will certainly reflect that. Due to the high volume of attendees and what we're hoping will be a lot of conversation, we will miss and also not be able to answer all of your questions and comments. Please know that this is not intentional. And please remember that discussion is not only contained to this event in this evening, but exists in later times through the archiving process and in the people in the previous conversations that helped us get here tonight. So with that note, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Nikki Giovanni, who will begin our evening. Good evening. Childhood remembrances are always a drag if you're black. You always remember things like living in Woodlawn with no inside toilet. And if you become famous or something, they never talk about how happy you are to have your mother all to yourself and how good the water felt when you got your bath from one of those big tubs that folk in Chicago barbecue in. And somehow, when you talk about home, it never gets across how much you understood their feelings as the whole family attended meetings about Hollydale. Mm -hmm. And even though you remember, your biographers never understand your father's pain as he sells his stock and another dream goes. And though you're poor, it isn't poverty that concerns you. And though they fought a lot, it isn't your father's drinking that makes any difference, but only that everybody is together and you and your sister have happy birthdays and very good Christmases. And I really hope no white person ever has cause to write about me because they never understand black love is black wealth 
and they'll probably talk about my hard childhood and never understand that all the while I was quite happy. And I wrote that, it's a poem called Nikki Rosa. I wrote that as probably the first poem that, that I wrote that um, uh, got any, I guess we would call it attention. But I, I think the first thing in terms of creative writing that we learn is that you don't write for, for an audience, you write for yourself. And in writing for yourself, you, you, you try to make sense out of your own life and make a decision about what's important. I'm 77 years old now. I was, uh, I think, 27 or 26 when I wrote Nikki Rosa. And uh, I made a decision that I was going to be happy. Uh, I, 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 would, I would probably not write this poem today because I know that um, there are a lot of things that uh, made me very unhappy. My, my father's drinking was one of them. And um, I, 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 in, in dealing with it, when I was younger, I decided I couldn't deal with it. So I decided not to deal with it. And I decided I wasn't going to let somebody make me deal with it. I do get uh, in, incredibly tired of, of the white, if I may, uh, sociologist, always deciding what it is in your life that's important and not, you can't decide that. I think it's important for you to decide. So I decided I was happy and I went to live with my grandmother and my, my poetry is gonna take another, uh, uh, another um, I guess we'd call it another uh, line. It's gonna take another curve because I'm gonna write as I see it. And I think that that's a, uh, I think as a writer, that's what's important. I said that to my students and I was waving, though nobody could see it. I was waving at Lamar, who made the mistake one day of calling me to, to uh, do an interview. <laughs> and as he was talking, I thought, oh, I'm, we should get this guy here. And we talked and talked and I finally, uh, 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 I didn't want to say force Lamar, but I really <laughs> pushed him like, you got to come to Virginia Tech. And he did. And I'm, I'm so glad. And I, I've been very fortunate at Virginia Tech uh, we have Lamar. I, I was able to, I don't want to say teach Lamar, I, I just think kind of be with Lamar because Lamar already knew what he was doing. I was able to to be with uh, Kwame Alexander, who has won many, many awards. And I think that we at Virginia Tech um, have, have been able to let people have their own voice. Jenny, of course, uh, 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 created, if I can say that, or not created, but uh, uh, the reason Jenny, the reason Gina is here is, is Jenny. And I think that that's, that's been one of the, she followed her. And we, we've done a, a, a lot with, with, with bringing people to our university. I like Virginia Tech. I, I, I think that we have as many problems as, uh, as anybody else. And, and uh, I think that, that, again, you have to make up your mind what's, what's important. I think that we're important. I think that VT is important. I've been there 32 years. It was the first, um, and I have to laugh about that. Uh, it was the first real job I ever had. And uh, uh, the, the day, uh, Jenny is, is very close to me. And the first time I got a, a paycheck, you know, you get your, your paycheck. And I got a paycheck, I think at the first of the month or something. And that was nice. And I deposited it and went on about my business. And about in the middle of the month, there was another one. And I went to Jenny. I said, oh, there's some mistake. They already paid me because I'm... <laughs> She, she said, no, you get one every, every two weeks. And I thought, damn, if I had known that, I, I, I would have taken a job a long time ago because I, I'm used to being on the road. And Lamar understands that too. I'm used to being on the road. You, you do what you do and you get a, a check and go on. So coming to, to tech was, was a whole nother idea. And you have an office too. And people come by the office and I'm on the fourth floor. And uh, I, I like the third floor. I just wrote a poem about that. I, I like the third floor because you, got, you, you get to, to, to uh, gossip on the third floor. And I think that uh, teaching is a lot of, I, I think it's a lot of fun. I've gotten to know people. I've gotten to be in, involved in, in things that probably I wouldn't have been involved in had I not uh, been a part of teaching. But I also know that being on the road, uh, and there, there are a lot of road songs, as we all know. Uh, one of the best voices uh, that we have here, I'm not saying other people can't sing, but Gina Chandler is one of the, the most beautiful voices that we've heard. And uh, we're just lucky that Gina did not go on the road because uh, if you had spent 10 years on the road, you'd have a whole different idea about what it's like because it's a whole nother world out there when you're going for bump, 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 bump. And it's, it's, it's wonderful because you get to know an audience and knowing an audience, I think, and, and again, as we're here, and there may be questions about that, of the two of us that I know, Lamar and I probably more than anyone know what it is to know an audience and what it is to walk in and be able to say, oh, this is my audience and, and to understand this is what I'm going to talk about today. 
this is what's important today. Am I making sense? I make, and I think that uh, that's important. I love this poem though, um, simply because it was honest and uh, it was good to be, <laughs> to realize, oh, I can, I can be honest, you know, <laughs> that, that writing is about honesty. It's not, it's not about somebody else deciding what I should say. It's about what I, what I should say. I think that that's what's important. I'm gonna hand you over now, if I may, to, to Dr. Chandler Smith. Unmuting, thank you, Nikki. <laughs> so uh, I'll begin by talking a little bit about the literature portion. And I'd like to first say that the power of study, the power of studying literature is its ability to shape and to tell stories, to help to expand our understanding of others, of difference, and to continually find new ways to think critically and fully about the human condition. And I think that's how we tell the stories is critically important. And that's what you hear in Nikki's poem and Nikki Rosa, right? The ability to tell her own story, her own way and not let someone else craft it for her. Indeed, often the story of African-Americans and of black people across the globe are ones where we're always victims in a story where whites are the victors. And so despite attempts to diminish the importance of the Black American story, to limit that story to a particular frame. I think one of the things that the study of literature teaches us is that Black matters are all around us and the ways in which we talk about those stories are uniquely different. So on the screen is a slide from um, the award-winning writer Charles Johnson in an essay that he wrote in 2008 called The End of the Black American Narrative where he examines that the conflict of the Black American story is first slavery, then segregation and legal disenfranchisement. The meaning of the story is group victimization and every Black person is the story's protagonist. And indeed, Dr. Johnson dovetails with Dr. Giovanni here on thinking about the ways in which we always see the Black American story, particularly through this lens of tragedy, and that there are other stories that can be told. Pardon me. So black fiction then all overwhelmingly comprises a tragic literature where whites in the history act and blacks can only react. So it's important for us to think about ways to challenge these dimensions. In the 21st century, he goes on to opine, we need new and better stories. And I might argue that we need a more complex understanding of the stories of black lives and to not just consider them through one frame or in one dimension. To be honest, there are many different ways in which we can frame the Black American story. We can start with a story of triumph, say for instance, in the African oral epic, the epic of Sundiata, which chronicles the life of Sundiata Keita, the founder of the Mali empire, is a very critical and important foundation in the shaping of African American narratives in types of works like praise poems, in Nikki's very famous poem, uh, ego tripping, there must be a reason why. It's a classic element of the epic and the praise poem presented for us and is anything but tragic. The myth of the flying Africans. This story recounts the tale of flying Africans who unwilling to submit to the cruelties of the lash, wandered into the wilderness, raised their arms to the heavens and took flight from bondage in the form of birds. The story embodies this would be narrative of slaves who defied attempts to bind them and created meaning and sense in a world and gave life to themselves and to successive generations. The trickster figure, a figure derived from African mythology again, who uses cunning, guile, and wit to outsmart and to thwart the power of opponent. I love this quotation from Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man from the narrator's grandfather, who says you have to overcome them with yeses, undermine them with grins, agree them to death and destruction, let them swallow you till they vomit or bust wide open, but never submit. The Conjurer, a diviner in the magic arts, including some of the things that you see here, who functions as an intermediary between the material and the spiritual world. Charles Chestnut's The Conjure Woman and Other Tales is a great reflection of that. Again, not a tragic element of literature at all, but a moment of great strength and power. I'm particularly thinking about near, uh, Charles Chestnut's The Gooford Grapevine, which was the first work by an African-American to appear in the prestigious magazine, The Atlantic Monthly largely because the editors were unaware of Chestnut's race at the time when the work was accepted for publication. 
Despite the work's challenge to the plantation tradition, a 19th century literary tradition that sought to reclaim the glory of the Old South, Chestnut was actually challenging this tradition through satire. And many prominent right writers and the writers on this editorial board failed to see the irony to the critique that Chestnut was placing there. Again, he was challenging the story, disrupting the narrative of Black lives. The bad man figure and the bad woman, additional figures that challenge this tragic narrative. These are figures who are indeed not tragic, but actually work against the structure of white supremacy. And again, give us a different image of black lives, black matters in ways that are significant and important for us to examine. So if we follow the story then, we need to think about the different narrative trails that the story presents. I'm drawn to think about our current moment in the midst of COVID-19, how a scientist might approach, right, the study of this disease. How we talk about infectious disease has serious consequences. We have to think about the narrative of contagion and outbreak, right? What are the pathways? What are the infection rates? What are the economic impacts? We see all of those conversations or stories happening. If we're not careful, different types of narratives or singular narratives can serve to stigmatize particular groups or individuals or locales, right? Some of the racist behavior that we see around anti-Asian rhetoric and this virus, right? If we're not careful about the types of stories we tell. So how we map the story of COVID-19 from transmission to post-infection is a process of examining multiple story through multiple narrative trails. And that's the important thing that I think literature and the study of literature, particularly African-American literature asks us to do. So now we're thinking about the ways in which African-American literature disrupts the narrative and gets us to think differently about black matters. I'm drawn to think about the murder of Emmett Lewis Till Right? And the important decision that his mother, Mamie Till Mobley made to show the world the brutality of that murder. She says, let the people see what I have seen. I think everybody needs to know what happened to Emmett Till. She changed the trajectory of the whole civil rights movement, the whole story of the South, the whole story of Jim Crow, the whole story of racial segregation and really started a movement of change in her very courageous decision to show this very difficult and traumatic moment in her life, the murder of her son. In fact, the story of Emmett Till has, has imbued the literary history and imagination of African-American literature and other literary traditions. And we see it all throughout poetry, drama, and autobiography in writers as diverse as the ones that you see here. I'm drawn to think about Gwendolyn Brooks's poem, A Bronzeville Mother Loiters in Mississippi, Meanwhile a Mississippi Mother Burns Bacon, where she challenges presumptive narratives of white southernness and chivalry. Here, the romantic role of the damsel in distress being applied to the white housewife um, that she re-envisions here as an expression of Carolyn Bryant, and that to an insecure and immature man, her husband, here, who's supposed to be the white knight, but instead his insecurities come forth, Roy Bryant. And then positioning Emmett Till, not as villain as the story often goes, but as a defenseless 14 year old boy. Brooks makes us think critically about the power of story and image and how the staidness of this image in the Southern imagination has created these moments of violence, the same kind of violence that we confront today. If we think about this contagion or disease of racism, when we frame the story in these ways, I'm drawn to think back historically to the yellow fever epidemic of the 18th century. The yellow fever epidemic exacerbated the disease of racism to epidemic proportions. Not only were African Americans forced to tend to the sick, but then they were subsequently blamed for the illness, for the contagion that was spreading. A writer like John Edgar Wideman, who you see here in these three texts, again, disrupts that narrative, gets us to think differently about the yellow fever epidemic and the different stories, the different ways in which Black lives were engaged in this particular historical moment. And again, changing our understanding of the city of brotherly love in Philadelphia, changing our understanding of the American nation, changing our understanding of African-Americans' relationship to religion, bringing us to a new level of consciousness about Black lives.
So if we think about this in our current cultural contemporary moment, it's a really good way to bring literature into this arc of the Black Lives Matters movement and why we do this teaching today. The Black Lives Matter movement wasn't just a response to, many of you may know, the killing of Trayvon Martin. Indeed, that was the spark but it became a movement out of that for preserving Black lives in myriad ways. I think it's interesting to look at one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, Opal Tometi, and what she has to say here from an a interview in The New Yorker about the Black Lives Movement that again gets us to think about the importance of story and what Dr. Giovanni says, the importance of our ability to tell our own story. So our demands, she notes, are also reflective of the fact that when we started Black Lives Matter, it wasn't solely about police brutality and extrajudicial killing. That was the spark point. But it was very emotional for us to talk about the way that Black lives are cut short all across the board. You can talk about the quality of our life in terms of housing and education and healthcare systems and the pandemic and what we're seeing there. So for us, it has been more comprehensive than just the criminal justice system and policing. It's bigger than that. And indeed, Black lives is bigger than that. It's bigger than the tragic narrative which we've always gotten. So as we follow the story down these diverse narrative trails and we disrupt the narrative, I'll end with this image from Claudia Rankin's 2014 uh, 14, excuse me, collection here, Citizen. The book's cover may be reminiscent of something we've seen before, a black hood suspended in white space that probably for many of us reminds us, provides a direct reference to Trayvon Martin's death in 2013. But ironically, interestingly, this image is of a work from 1993, two years after Rodney King was beaten senseless by members of the LAPD. It's called In the Hood, and it suggests that racism passes freely among homonyms. Here, the importance of word, text, and image. The word citizen, the word American lyric, uh, excuse me, American lyric, the image of the hood. All of these things suggest the importance of literature in forcing us to follow different narrative trails, different stories, and to disrupt the narrative. We can see the danger if we don't do these things in the kind of murders that we've seen, the kind of killings that we've seen in our world, where a man can't sit in his car, or a woman can't be in her own home, or a young boy can't walk down the street. If we can't police our imagination, Claudia Rankin says, Black men, and I would suggest Black people are dying. If the story remains stayed, static, in this tragic position, then we don't leave space for Black matters to function in many ways, and we devalue the importance of Black lives. I'll now turn the screen over to Dr. Katie Carmichael. Thank you, Gina. All right, I'm gonna share my screen, and I'm gonna represent linguistics. So one of the things that I find most fascinating about linguistics is that the structure of language can be incredibly complex, and yet babies are able to acquire these patterns. And children acquire the patterns of the people they grow up around. So if you grow up in a small Appalachian town, you'll likely acquire the accent that everyone in that town speaks with. Similarly, children who grow up in the Black community will acquire features that are used by the speakers around them. These language patterns are part of African-American language. It's an umbrella term for the linguistic features that characterize varied groups in the US with African roots. Today, I'm gonna focus on African-American English specifically. Now, we cannot discuss African-American language without acknowledging that a major contribution to distinctively black ways of speaking is the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, and the continued segregation of major US cities. If we speak like the people we grow up around, racial segregation will produce linguistic differentiation. African-American English is characterized by systematic and rule-governed linguistic features on all levels of structure, pronunciation, verbal conjugations, word choice, not to mention interactional norms and communicative traditions. Despite this fact, a major misunderstanding about African-American English is that it's just slang or poor grammar. While a lot of popular slang is taken from African-American English, in part because of Black artists driving music, fashion, and pop culture trends, we know that there are features of African-American English that have been consistently present for over 100 years. Moreover, African-American English features are analogous to forms of variation we see in other languages of the world. And crucially, because the grammar rules of African-American English are specific, 
and systematic, it's possible to misuse some features to produce utterances in African-American English that would be judged ungrammatical or nonsensical by native speakers. These kinds of language myths are ideologies, beliefs and biases about language. A major bias in the US is that there's a singular correct way to speak, the standard, and that any way of speaking that deviates from this norm is subordinate, less valuable. Linguists call this standard language ideology. And notably, the standard is based on dominant groups, white, upper middle class, highly educated, heterosexual, cis male speech. So when we embody negative ideologies about African-American language, we are indeed espousing anti-Black beliefs and glorifying whiteness as the linguistic goal. Now, ideologies are sneaky. They turn into invisible assumptions that we take for granted as facts or the way it is. And they can become especially harmful when they go unquestioned and influence behaviors and policies. One example of this is linguistic profiling or using speech characteristics to identify a speaker's ethnic background. As it turns out, listeners are quite good at this. Now, the process of noticing linguistic features and their social patterning is more or less automatic. You don't have control over this and you may not even be consciously aware of it. It becomes a problem when people act on this in discriminatory ways. John Baugh and Associates examine the way that linguistic profiling can affect housing options. Baugh made hundreds of phone calls asking about rentals in affluent, mostly white neighborhoods and in more mixed neighborhoods in the Bay Area, which you can see represented on the X axis here. Crucially, Baugh made some phone calls using African-American English and some using standard English. As you can see, the whiter the neighborhood, the fewer appointments Baugh confirmed in response to phone calls using African-American English, demonstrating that racial profiling can happen even based on language alone. Another example of linguistic profiling comes from Staum Casasanto and Associates, building on a famous study that tests implicit bias by presenting uh, the image of a weapon or tool followed by the image following an image of a black or white face. It has been shown that a black face biases participants to categorize the item as a weapon. Replicating the study with black voices using African-American English, the same effects were found. That is hearing African-American English primes listeners to expect violence. As you can imagine, this has some pretty scary implications. And these issues carry over to the criminal justice system. Linguists examine the effect of African-American English in the case against George Zimmerman, who killed 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. The key witness to the case was Rachel Jantel, whose high rates of vernacular African-American English features were mocked and misunderstood in the courtroom and by the media. She was described by one of the jurors as hard to understand and thus not credible. George Zimmerman was ultimately acquitted. As linguist John Rickford put it, Jantel's dialect was found guilty before Zimmerman was found innocent. Following up on this line of research, Jones et al. tested the abilities of court transcribers to accurately capture African-American English. Court reporters are meant to be certified 95 to 99% accurate, which is the red line you see here on this chart. You can see that none of the court reporters in this study achieved this threshold and many were significantly below it. Unfortunately, one place where linguistic bias has a stronghold and constantly reproduces itself across generations is in schools. Some examples of the linguistic marginalization of African-American English speaking students include speech impairment misdiagnoses by assessment tools that are biased against non-mainstream dialects of English, disproportionate placement in special education, and higher failure rates for students who produce supposed grammatical errors stemming from African-American English features. Unfortunately, a lot of current education policies derive from outdated or problematic research. An especially harmful and pervasive example of this comes from the idea of a word gap or language gap, or even on occasion, the 30 million word gap, deriving from a much criticized 1995 study claiming that students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds enter school with significantly fewer words in their vocabulary. The sample for this study was skewed such that much more of the participants from lower socioeconomic backgrounds were black. A number of linguists have pointed out that none of the researchers had a linguistic understanding of the language patterns in black communities and that number of words is not a meaningful metric for linguistic skill. Despite these critiques, word gap research still impacts school policy with many schools focused on bridging the word gap instead of considering the ways that the system itself sets these students up to fail. While it's essential to talk about the serious repercussions of anti-Black language biases in our institutions, it's equally important not to define African-American English by this negativity. And the fact that African-American language varieties continue to thrive despite all this external negativity underscores that these language varieties have essential value to their speakers to mark identity and belonging. 
John Baugh points out that skillful and witty use of language in a spontaneous and authoritative manner is central to many black rhetorical styles, such as freestyling, rap battles, and signifying. Quest MCODY adds to this, there are probably more people that would have been English majors or writers in hip hop than there is in any other genre. Just the usage of words like metaf metaphors, similes, double entendres, triple entendres. And this verbal art, this demonstration of community belonging through language use is a form of everyday resistance. And Charity Hudley says, blackness is joy, it's the magic. It's the soulful and spiritual resistance that says in any given moment, you may be oppressing me, but I do not want your crumbs. As April Baker Bell writes, I've always marveled at the way black people in my community would talk that talk. From signifying to habitual be to call and response, my linguistic community had a way of using language that was powerful, colorful, and unique. Black language for me has always reflected black people's ways of knowing, interpreting, surviving, and being in this world. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Sheila Carter Todd. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm going, I think, yep, waiting for our slides to come up. Jen and I are working together and she's going to uh, facilitate the slides for us. So uh, welcome to all of you. And let me get just a second. Trying to get my script up. Hmm. Just a second. Okay. okay so just trying to get the uh, view so that I can get it, so that I can actually see what I'm planning to say to you all. Just, and I'm running into some challenges with my screen. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> As I have mentioned before in my bio, a great deal of my work focuses on writing pedagogy and writing program administration. What I have found in my work is that the value of a writing program, the values are made manifest in the priorities of the curriculum. This evening, what I am proposing is that that curricular vision is needed in order to address black matters in the composition classroom. The Council of Writing Program Administrators, the National Council of Teachers of English, the National Writing Project, Teachers Instructional Guidelines, and the Curricular Guidelines for the College Board Advanced Placement Language and Composition courses all foreground rhetorical knowledge as a key component of secondary and post-secondary writing instruction. The Council of Writing Program Administrators defines rhetorical knowledge as the ability to analyze contexts and audiences, and then to act on those, that analysis in comprehending and creating texts. Rhetorical knowledge is the basis of composing. Writers develop rhetorical knowledge by negotiating purpose, audience, context, and conventions as they compose a variety of texts for different situations. While I agree that foregrounding rhetorical knowledge is indeed an effective approach to writing instruction, I do not agree with the default to a single seemingly neutral concept of rhetoric for that knowledge. In fact, in the absence of any designation of an understanding of the range of rhetorics on which a course could focus, we must ask whose rhetoric? A survey of curricula, textbooks, and digital instructional tools, tools on rhetorical analysis shows that most instruction is focused on Aristotelian rhetorical model with the consideration of culture as part of the larger context. This approach sees culture as a consideration of rhetoric, yet still presents rhetoric as, a monolithic, as monolithic or neutral. Cultural rhetorics scholars challenge a singular default concept of rhetoric and rhetorical knowledge with, more, with a more encompassing perspective of rhetoric that foregrounds culture. In their 2018 article, Interfacing Cultural Rhetorics, a, a History and a Call, the authors who are listed on the slide um, stated that the study of cultural rhetorics is often formulated as an interrogation of both culture and rhetorics. Thus, this inquiry understand, understands constructions of culture and rhetoric as interdependent rather than stable. So what they were saying is the culture and rhetoric are mutually informed and overlapping in ways which, ret which rhetoric and culture can interface. Cultural rhetoric scholars and practitioners in writing studies explore a range of rhetorics, African-American rhetorics, Native American rhetorics, Chicano-Chicano rhetorics, Asian-American rhetorics, queer rhetorics, rhetorics, and that's just to name a few. Yet these rhetorics are rarely incorporated into the curricula of a foundational writing course. I argue that if culture and rhetoric are mutually informed and overlapping, then black matters as issues regarding identity, language, personhood, citizenship, art, communication, and other dimensions of black life 
inside the writing classroom equals instruction in African-American rhetorics in the secondary and post-secondary composition classroom. I realize that most secondary and post-secondary teachers and or GTA's preparatory programs do not include courses in other rhetorics and that those teaching composition may be unaware of what African-American rhetoric is. In their 2018 book on African-American rhetoric, Keith Gilliard and Adam Banks define African-American rhetorics as the arc of strategic language use by African-Americans from rhetorical forms such as slave narratives and the spirituals to black digital expression and contemporary activism. In her syllabus for an intro to African-American rhetorics course and on her website, Carmen Kennard builds on this definition by stating that African-American rhetoric is more than just speeches, marches, and public presentations by black people, though it is, it does include that. African-American rhetoric is about freedom, imagination, and the ways that all forms of language and communication work towards those freedoms with all the complications fully on deck. And in their edited collection, African-American Rhetoric's Interdisciplinary Perspectives, Elaine Richards and Ronald Jackson define African-American rhetorics as the study of culturally and discursive developed knowledge forms, communicative practice and persuasive strategies rooted in freedom struggle by people of African ancestry in America, in America. This critical approach allows not only for analysis of discourse, but also consideration of how we can better accommodate the development of empowering rhetoric. In each of these definitions, I've highlighted key components illustrating how African-American rhetorics not only meets, but also exceeds the rhetorical knowledge that is described as an outcome for students in composition or writing classrooms. In their 2018 anthology, The Ruthledge Reader of African-American Rhetoric, uh, Rashawn Young and Michelle Bachelor Robinson illustrate how a composition course can teach rhetorical analysis with an Afrocentric focus focusing on key components of African-American rhetoric. Their approach expands the rhetorical triangle to a star that includes language, style, discourse, perspective, community, and what they call suasion. Ronald Jackson in his 1995 book, Towards an African Methodology for a Critical Assessment of Rhetoric, provides another possible model for teaching rhetorical analysis in a writing classroom, moving away from the rhetorical tri triangle and instead centering, centering on the word, nomo. His analytical approach employs uh, con uh, components of, of which African-American rhetorical tradition can constellate around the word. Jackson states that all activity of men and all movements on nature rest on the word. While these are just two examples, there are many, many more, some of which I've included in the bibliography that will be available with the source materials provided at the end of the teach-in. What I'm proposing is that we no longer consider writing courses um, about some neutral or default concept of rhetorical knowledge, but instead create writing curricula that provides students with the ability to identify with, understand, analyze, and create text based on knowledge of rhetorics, plural. Thank you. And I will turn this over to Dr. Jennifer Sano-Franchini, who will explain more about the myth of neutrality. Hi, okay, so I'm gonna talk about the myth of neutrality in the teaching of writing. In shifting out of neutral, centering difference, bias, and social justice in a business writing course, Cecilia Shelton observed that, quote, undergraduate students who are learning to communicate with the specialized technical genres and rhetorical conventions of their disciplines are often operating under a disciplinary logic that suggests to them that difference, including differences among bodies, should be either neutralized or commodified. In other words, the way professional writing tends to get taught and talked about often presumes the possibility of neutrality. As a result, Shelton helps me to think about the many ways that the myth of neutrality persists in the teaching of writing. Take for instance, the assumption that professional and technical writing can and should be neutral, that it's possible and preferable to write a factual and objective technical report or manual, and that this is the kind of neutral writing that we should be teaching our students. In fact, there are many seemingly neutral but culturally contingent terms such as professional, technical, appropriate, and clear that are frequently used to assess student writing and engagement. And I wanna be clear in stating that I'm implicating myself here as well. However, we need to be asking ourselves, are we using these terms in monolithic ways? Because if so, there's a good chance we are authorizing a white value system 
and way of making sense of the world. As folks like George Lipsitz have argued, white, quote, whiteness never has to speak its name, never has to acknowledge its role as an organizing principle in social and cultural relations, end quote. As a result, whiteness becomes the standard for all institutionalized measures of value without being marked as such. It's assumed to be neutral. And too often, those who are different from the white neutral are regulated and policed into compliance. Going back to Shelton's point, too often black students' language practices and moves to transcend conventions and standards are corrected and made to comply with the white norm. I argue that this tendency speaks to a larger culture of policing in contemporary US society of which education is one part. Recent uprisings over anti-Black police violence across the globe offer a renewed moment to examine how the policing of Black bodies is enacted across many different social systems, including in education. So what, I, what do I mean when I say teaching as policing? I'm talking about the ways that classrooms become a space where compliance and the neutralization of difference is demanded. There are many examples where Black students Dress, hair, behaviors, eye contact, attitudes, and language have been policed. And there are times in the writing classroom when concerns about whether a student uses I, whether they are on social media during class time, their ability to adhere to standardized American English, and catching acts of plagiarism are treated as bigger concerns than critically engaged teaching and learning itself. In her recent book, Linguistic Justice, Black Language, Literacy, Identi Identity, and Pedagogy, April Baker Bell argued that the policing of Black language and literacies in schools is not separate from the ways in which Black bodies have historically been policed and surveilled in U.S. society. The ubiquitous assault and murder of Black bodies is not independent of the symbolic linguistic violence and spirit murder that Black students experience daily in the classrooms. So what can teachers do? Some ideas are to attend to bodies, mark whiteness, and contextualize seemingly neutral terms. We should move from teaching as policing to teaching as supporting students through the experience of learning. Also going back to Dr. Carter Todd's presentation, we should ask ourselves whose ways of knowing are prioritized in our pedagogies, assignments, and assessments. As we do so, we'll need to ask ourselves, how must we redefine professionalism when we center Black lives, Black experiences, Black ways of knowing? How must we redefine appropriateness when we center Black lives, Black experiences and Black ways of knowing? How must we redefine civility when we center Black lives, Black experiences, and Black ways of knowing? Finally, we need to understand and work toward true um, inclusion. So to that end, I conclude with another quote by Cecilia Shelton, who explained, quote, to include me is to share the labor of making sense of my intellectual contribution with me, even when, perhaps especially when, my ways of knowing and being my references and insights are not familiar or easily accessible to those of you who are operating out of traditional Western knowledge and value systems. These are our sources, and now I will turn it over to Alexa Garboyle. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, though I am a poet here at Virginia Tech, I'm gonna speak from my experience as a teacher of young writers. So for four years, I ran a high school creative writing program and literary magazine at the arts school um, at a with a racially diverse student population. And I just wanted to share with you tonight some relationship-based strategies I've used to elevate the voices and visions of young Black writers themselves through mentoring and providing a platform for creative work. And I think um, even though I'm speaking specifically about creative writing, I think these strategies can be adapted to other contexts and disciplines really easily. So I'm gonna start just by echoing what Dr. San Sano Franchini was just talking about, um, that really no matter how accepting a school seems, an educational institution will still uphold principles of white supremacy by default. Um, I saw it in the multiple schools that I worked in through dress code violations, behavioral referrals, microaggressions from white classmates, and the institutional red tape that prevented black and brown students from accessing higher level coursework. 
And even within the walls of my classroom, racist systems were at play on a daily basis too. So the literary canon, the publishing industry, cultural assumptions created by media about what writers look like, act like, and write like, and the educational system as a whole. So who this school is for, who will succeed, who should be seen and heard, and who shouldn't be. So because all those systems are operating in my classroom, it's of course my responsibility to challenge them in order to do right by my students. And that starts with relationships and seeing the talent of each student writer. The role model effect tells us it's important to see someone who looks like us in a position we want. This concept has been used to explain the great impact of having even one black teacher in elementary school on the academic outcomes of black students. And this concept can also be key to expanding definitions of writers and writing both for students and for the campus community. So in order to take advantage of the benefits of the role model effect and disrupt the status quo, I'd urge folks to think about centering blackness in these three areas. And this is echoing what my colleagues have said. So in the curriculum, in the instructor, and in the public spaces of the school, like our campus, like assemblies and publications. So in the curriculum, we know we need to teach black texts and my colleagues have provided really fantastic resources on liberatory texts and modes of analysis in the bibliography. Um, for me, especially when teaching creative genres dominated by popular connotations of whiteness, like for instance, the sonnet, I find it helps all students to read black authors, black formalists, so shout out to Gwendolyn Brooks, Terrence Hayes. In creative writing, we can also embrace spoken word storytelling music through unit plans that engage with a more inclusive understanding of language arts beyond the just European history of publishing words on a page. Um, and in terms of the curriculum, I think about this in a self-reflexive way. So when I'm not getting through to a student when they're bored or somehow disengaged, I need to take a look at what I'm not seeing. And often that is related to their talents. And I've learned to be flexible and adapt to those unique talents of my students. So just a few stories. One afternoon, um, two of my black students were challenging my white students one by one to a freestyle competition, which was not on the lesson plan and that was not part of the songwriting unit we were in. Uh, and none of those students took the bait because they didn't have the skills. And at that moment, I realized um, that even the writing process itself where you draft and you revise and you publish doesn't actually assess or privilege the skill of improvisation, which is an incredible skill and it should. Um, that same year, I had an extremely talented musician who you see here who had produced multiple albums by the time he was a junior and sometimes didn't want to do um, my little writing assignments. Uh, because they weren't relevant and I knew I had to be flexible because he had talent um, and his interests were valuable and meaningful. So for instance, during National Novel Writing Month, he produced a narrative album. And later that year, we were able to center his brilliance even more when he became the composer and managing producer for a collaborative spoken word album our class created over the course of a month. Each student reported to him. So whereas some teachers may have seen this student as a problem or defiant, which he was not, in fact, he just needed a larger platform. So I would say consider asking students what they want, get to know their talents, and then cater to those special talents. And you don't have to worry about losing your authority and by not sticking to the plan, because that's actually the point. So just let them tell their stories. Um, in terms of centering blackness in the instructor, how can a white teacher center blackness in her own classroom? So you can bring in guest lecturers, teaching artists, and readers who don't share your identity markers. Um, these visits allow Black students to see more role models and plus learning from Black teachers has been shown and we know to benefit all students. Um, so for resources on guest artists or lecturers, you might check out the Local Arts Council, community youth writing programs, or bookstore and university reading series. You can partner with nearby faculty or even book remote guest speakers. 
And I actually found on students end of the year reflections that the most memorable lessons from the entire semesters were often taught by someone other than myself. Um, I can also create leadership opportunities for my own black students to teach both in my classroom and other colleagues classrooms. So I solicit former students to come back as guest teachers, workshop leaders or special presenters. This also creates opportunities for them. Just because I'm not black doesn't mean my students can't have black teachers. And then in terms of centering blackness in public spaces, for me, this is always about increasing visibility. So the public sphere of the campus is another place to challenge white definitions of writing and writers. Selecting departmental awards, assembly performers, and pieces for the literary magazine should involve disrupting systems that are set up to overlook black talent. In the department, we can have frank conversations about who's getting awards and attempt to remove the biases at play in the selection process. By encouraging and selecting Black students to share their work at school-wide events, the definition of writers can shift for the student body and faculty alike. Moreover, readings allow students to share their stories with the school, expanding others' understanding of Black experience. And there are enough models of white writers for the rest of the student body. Um, and if you're involved in publication, like I was, training Black student leaders proportionally representing the demographics of the student body and privilege, privileging otherwise marginalized voices on the page should be a priority. One of my fantastic uh, editors in chief of my literary magazine did some demographics work on our magazine, showed it to the other editors and told them to do better. And they did. Staffers also published spoken word pieces and music to continue pushing against the written word as the only form of literary art. So the mission of white supremacy, as we know, attempts to constrain, restrict, and dismiss brilliance that can't be contained. So I see it as the educator's role to make way for that genius and give it a platform, even if it's not what you're familiar with. And that means decentering myself, admitting that I am not always the expert, and that my Black students have so much to offer me and each other in this work. Thank you all, and I hope this presentation has given you some ideas, and now I'm going to pass it off to fellow writer Dr. L. Lamar Wilson. Thanks, Alexa. If only we had all had high school teachers like her, right? Um, I am here to uh, share with you tonight the foundation I established at Virginia Tech as an MFA poetry candidate and graduate a decade ago and how it has morphed into on the ground activism for atonement for victims of white nationalist terrorism, um, as well as a short documentary film that aims to awaken viewers to a need to assume an anti-racist posture in their day-to-day -day lives. So we'll watch a short clip from the film, The Changing Same. The sound isn't on. Oh. Racist, you know, that they had racist beliefs and they treated people of color uh, as inferiors. They never taught me hate and they never were hateful, violently hateful, you know, uh, caustically hateful. We were both at Miranda High School when it first integrated in 1965. I have classmates who report, you know, being spat on, cursed at, mistreated, and I never really saw them lose it. And I'm amazed at that. Mm. I truly am amazed with how adult they were as Children, really, you know, 15, 16 year olds. What do you think would have happened to those kids if they spit back? Uh, you know, I hadn't thought about exactly, or, you know. I think it would have become violent. I think they knew it would have become violent.
there was a man that wasn't directly kin to me, but somehow through marriage, family kind of put up with him when he would show up. And, uh, you know, he used to get his kicks by telling me a little kid, he didn't want to hear these things about racial violence that he portrayed him. You know, he, he had a baseball bat in his closet. And he was going to show it to me if I ever came by his house and it still had the blood on it. <clears throat> well, they tied this kid to a tree and beat him to death. Uh, goes back to early childhood memories that I've been hearing about this stuff. I heard there's a few fingers around town. Well, we'll talk about this later. <laughs> I'll throw it. Uh, the existence of, of body parts in town. Preserved. They were waiting for me at the courthouse. People riding in cars, checking on me. It became a huge event that first year. The disappointing thing was that in subsequent years, nobody has returned and nothing has happened. That third year, Miss Allie Mae asked my mother to tell me, please don't do this another year because people had started to call her well, you know, we don't want to have any trouble for you. Um, so my, my talk really is uh, about this film, The Changing Same, and, and the journey that, that got us there. But I really want us to get to revisit that moment that you've just seen where um, we, we take some people who are used to being spectators um, and they are centered in a way that they're not accustomed to. I wanna begin though with the poem that led us uh, to this moment. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you might have to reshare your screen. Am I not sharing it? Yeah. Oh, did, you, did, you un did you unshare after I started sharing? I did, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Um, I was, and I was doing that with intention, I actually wanted them to be hearing my voice while I was pulling this up to make it more seamless, but I'm sorry I didn't convey that. Um, okay, Are, is everyone able to see now? Uh, let me go back. I'm not sure what happened when you unshare because now I can't share my screen again. Okay. Um, where? Can you try one more time? Um, there we go. Can you see it now? It's about to, it's coming up. There we go. Thank you, Lamar. All right. Sorry about that, you all. I was trying to make it seamless by, because uh, I honestly didn't want you to see me on screen. I was really trying to center those two and I didn't convey that. Uh, to um, to my colleague here. But um, as I was saying, um, I, I wanna start at the poem um, that, that, that generated all this. In the spring of 2010, as I completed my master's thesis, I decided to engage uh, two age old traditions, the poetics of witness and the confessional, uh, employing, employing two decades of research to reflect on racial tension in my hometown, Mariana, Florida, um, which you see discussed in the film when you watch it. One of the most charged poems um, that I created in that semester um, uses details from family anecdotes and a 1982 historical account titled The Anatomy of a Lynching, which you can see hyperlinked here um, on the slide that you'll have at your disposal. Um, and it contains um, the following words that are pretty graphic um, with intention. So this is the sort of content warning, warning that, um, that this is with intention to um, to put some things before you um, that, that might be uh, uh, shocking. Um, to underscore the horror of this dehumanizing practice that continues in this country, unmitigated by federal law. There's a, there's a bill right now that's stalemate uh, in Congress. 
concerning lynching. This is from uh, the poem that would ultimately be called Resurrection Sunday. A man holds his penis in his mouth, sprawled on a cheap sofa like the one that holds my bare backside. He stares blankly through the lens at the director for his cues, through me reaching for his gaze. I'm 20 something and home alone. In the picture, Claude is alone, but as she speaks, kids blur into the sepia background, ape the grins on their parents' faces, await their turn to prod his charred flesh. The boy wants to ask where the family of Lola, Claude's slain lover lives, where his pickled prick must collect dust on some shelf to say, I want to study it. He wants to see how he'd hang, loose to rove in a bottle, but he is a boy. He does not know how to speak the unspeakable yet. The poem ultimately titled, as I said, Resurrection Sunday, because it also examines the murderous hanging of black men in, in public alongside the spectacle hanging of Jesus Christ, will be praised among peers in the workshop with Professor Erica Meitner, be published in a respected literary uh, magazine the following year, nominated for a Pushcart Prize, and become a signature piece lauded in reviews of my debut collection, uh, Sacrilegion, which was an award winner. And it would be like, you know, the, the just like Nikki Giovanni's poem, Nikki Rosa, it would be the poem that everybody wanted me to perform. Um, it's a very long poem, which is why I'm only able to give you excerpts. And quite honestly, I felt sick about it. While I should have been proud from, by most standards at these accomplishments, I was ashamed. I felt it wrong that I would gain a claim for something born out of such pain, even if it was helping the daughter of Claude Neal, the lynching victim and her family, as they fought to get Loretta Lynch's um, Justice Department to reopen the case. The poem felt inadequate, so I decided on the 80th anniversary to run the distance of uh, Neal's corpse traveled to the infamous tree where his remains were hanged, where thousands gathered um, in one is, what is still considered one of the most uh, celebrated, well-known lynchings uh, in American history. Um, Neil's daughter and grandchildren were close family kin, still are. So with their permission, I did just that. I ran about 14 miles from the, the place where he had been uh, initially killed to the, that tree. And then fast forward um, several years, um, and I joined in collaboration with the Rider Film Group with directors Joe Brewster and Michelle uh, Stevenson to make the film that you've just seen a clip of, um, which began airing last summer on PBS and streams online at least through 2022, 2023 at American Documentary. Hopefully we'll find a home for it for an extended period of time after that. Um, but the film traces not only the, the run that I did, but its aftermath. But what I showed you tonight, the clip that I showed you um, was important to me because I want to discuss what you see on the screen here, this notion of the oppositional gaze. Collaborating with Rada as an associate producer gave me an opportunity to repair where I felt I had failed in, the, in my poem and do what had not been done, flip the script as it were, and turn the gaze from my multi-ethnically black, differently abled, queer bodies act of protest onto the predominantly white, socially liberal audience that PBS curries. These people are like George and Pam Little, who you saw in the clip, um, um, who eschew racism, but do little else because we've not asked them to do anything other than be not racist. And so um, this idea of the oppositional gaze born out of an essay by Bell Hooks in, uh, from 1992, is a critique of an earlier essay by a white feminist named Laura Mulvey from 1975 called The Visual Pleasure and Narrative, uh, called Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. I've hyperlinked both of those for you all to, to read on your own time. But in short, Mulvey's uh, essay argues that white men who are on screen and whose gaze is framed by white men beyond the mirror that the camera essentially is, 
embody a kind of ideal ego through which they and most white viewers see others, particularly feminized bodies of desire. So we are seeing the world through these white men's eyes and our desires are supposed to be their desires. So her critique universalizes basically white women's desires and sort of saying like white women don't get to see themselves as beautiful. Um, Bell Hooks comes along to enter the gap and rejects Mulvey's and other scholars subsequent posture of passive spectatorship, which lets this detached gaze reflective in response to misogyny off the hook. Its own white feminine subjectivities, the only ones acknowledged as significant, rendering the active posture of resistance, including the point of view and desires of black women and otherwise femme bodies of color invisible. And so what we've tried to do, what Michelle Stevenson, who's an award-winning filmmaker, um, decided to do, and we, we worked hard to collaborate together, was to make sure that this wasn't just about watching Lamar run around Mariana's streets and you know running past these antebellum homes that are shrines to the Confederacy. I mean, this town is a shrine to the Confederacy. They're monuments to the Confederacy on every turn um, that probably will not come down, um, in, even in this moment. And so, it was more important to us to, to decide to capture this audience and, and give them this oppositional gaze and to propose what we are calling, um, uh, uh, which is, it brings me to my last point. Um, there's a book now that I feel that every teacher should be getting, should be every person who wants to be a part of doing something different in this moment than you've ever done before, um, including black and brown folks. Um, it, it's a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And in this book, Ibram Kendi posits that those who wish to be allies must abandon this false sense of safety that I'm not a racist is enough. One that demures or engages in the discomforting defensive laughter that our film exposes here of George and Pam Little um, in the face of anti-blackness. It's sort of say like, I'm not like them. I don't wanna talk about it. You know, I'll tell you off camera. Um, one that refuses to confront racism to moving into a posture of one that confronts racism with the same willful fervor as that which gets weaponized by those whose disregard for black life and subjectivity we see on display in everyday political speechifying and most especially in the videos of murder of modern day lynching to which we've been rendered passive spectators and that we see seemingly every day on the news. Um, and so I'll end there hopefully within the Q&A that we can talk about what anti-racism really means and how the art that I want to make um, will not do just what my poem did 10 years ago, that the, that the art that I'm making now demands of, of those who are engaging it, whoever that audience may be, as Nikki said, we never know who it is. We're really, really writing for ourselves. But I'm demanding of myself more from my poetry and my art than what I was doing 10 years ago. And I'm, I'm demanding of my readers that they do not be more than come to my poems just to be entertained or to be moved to tears, but actually to be moved to action. So my last comment is, this is Allie Mae Neal Smith, Claude Neal's daughter, passed away last year, having endured roughly 75 years um, of being the specter of what America had done to her father and to her. I mean, she walked with a limp because in the wake of his murder, uh, white mobs came into town and tried to kill her and other people. Uh, because she was a beloved member of my family, I made sure to spend time with her in the days before she transitioned. And one of the things we discussed is this, and this is a question I posit to you. Must black, brown, LGBTQIA, differently, differently abled, neurodiverse bodies bear the burden of saving America's soul alone. I'm, I'm of course riffing on a, a old Negro spiritual, which I hope brings our conversation full circle. I say, no, I say, it's your turn. And it begins with embracing vigilant anti-racism as a posture in every aspect of your lives. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so what we're going to do is move into our uh, Q&A um, portion of the event. And so um, my team of moderators have been pulling together some questions. Uh, and I'm going to start with a, a couple of qu a question for Katie Carmichael. Dr. Katie Carmichael. So um, <clears throat> Anita Puckett would like to hear more about internal grammatical variations in various registers of so-called African-American English, uh, such as local Wake Forest English speech. 
Yeah, I might need to hear a little bit more about what um, what she wants to hear, but um, absolutely, there's uh, tons of variation uh, across uh, African American language that we weren't really able to get into today. Um, I would have loved to have talked about Black ASL um, and um, you know uh, Louisiana Creole, where you know I do my research in Louisiana. Um, absolutely, I think there's a uh, significance to uh, the the regional variation that you see in African American language, um, and I think that's a huge part of the identity that you're expressing as well. Um, and it would be a mistake to treat it, you know, treat African American language as monolithic. So yeah, thank you. If, if that's what you're going for, then thank you for helping me clarify that, Anita. And uh, another question by Ashley Pollitt and Emily Cash. Um, and I actually think that this might touch nicely, not just with um, Katie, what you talked about uh, with linguistics, but also what Lamar just ended us on uh, by bringing in like neurodivergence. Um, but both of these two would like to know more about overrepresentation of black students in special education programs, as well as how standardized testing in public schools does not consider linguistic differences and subsequently labels students as um, recipients of special education curriculums. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's really complicated um, because simultaneously there's overrepresentation um, of students who are speaking, you know, their their home dialect, their home language, um, in classrooms to predominantly white teachers who don't have any knowledge of these uh, linguistic features, and um, so there's actually a study that has found uh, a a correlation between how many white teachers are in a school and how many black male students are placed into special education. So absolutely, we have to talk about, um, you know, exactly um, what Lamar was saying about learning to be anti-racist and um, the onus being on uh, the teacher. And, um, you know, I really liked uh, where Jennifer and Alexa and Sheila all brought these ideas into the classroom um, and, um, these ways of encouraging um, your all of your students and all of the different types of abilities. Um, I was just uh, reading a, a section of uh, Kendi's book today that talks about standardized testing, that talks about the fact that this derives from IQ testing, which derives from racist ideas about IQs um, mattering across races. And of course we know that um, race is socially constructed. It's not real. There's no actual physical, biological truth to it. Um, so um, if you have a test that shows disparity, that means there's something wrong with the test. And I'm so heartened by um, bringing in what Gina said about um, COVID-19 causing some changes, seeing so many people dropping the GRE and dropping the SAT mm -hmm. from their requirements. That is a, a crucial anti-racist step. And now I'm gonna let other people talk. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the moment is the, to not let this moment pass, right? To sort of say like, okay, now that we've realized what has happened, who, who are we admitting that we weren't admitting before, let's not go back, right? <laughs> let's not go back to the, the, the wheel that was broken, right? Let's not put that broken wheel back on the, on the, on the car. Totally. Would anyone like to add anything else to that? I would just say that what's also interesting about this conversation, and we link it to anti-racism and the discourse in COVID-19, is again, also recognizing that this is a story we've seen before, but we haven't been listening to the narrative pathway. I mean, what's happened in terms of anti-Black violence um, around many of the victims that we've seen in the last two months it is very reminiscent to the narrative of Emmett Till, to the narrative of Claude Neal, and to the narrative of others. But we haven't been listening. As Lamar says, we have, we have removed ourselves. Um, people have averted the gaze, and not just the gaze of, instead of looking outward, but looking inward, right? And that very crucial, uncomfortable moment in his film shows us that. So we not only have to be aware that there are multiple narrative pathways, but we also have to be aware of the ways in which we refuse to allow the story to take us in different dimensions and different directions because of our need to continue to hear the same things repeated back to us. Because of what would happen if we realize those fictions that, that undergirded our very identity are exactly that, fictions. As Toni Morrison says, who are we without it, right? Mm -hmm. what, are you, what, what, are you, what are you if you don't have that, mm -hmm. you know? 
you're going to have to make up something else. And of course, the people to teach you, as Nikki would always tell us, are Black folks. We've been doing it from the very beginning. We've had to do it. So sit back and learn. It's, it's not an accident that all of a sudden the person who's going to recover America is going to be some woman of color, right, to help, help Uncle Joe get to the White House. It's not an accident because these are the people who've had to make up the stories and, and build themselves from nothing. So what does it mean, white folks, if you have to build yourself without all of these things that make you inherently better than the people that you've been inherently better than, including women, including differently. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna take time for you to search within your soul and find something else other than be than better than me and all these other people on the screen. Mm -hmm. I also think that there needs to be a challenge to the infrastructures that sort of separate people out. And I think one of the largest educational infrastructures are the curricula that we continue to perpetuate in terms of making sure that we keep certain people in certain places. And so I think there's a lot, even the administrative structure of higher education is set up in such a way that it honors certain kinds of knowledge. And so, and it perpetuates itself. So we think all, before we can even get to the level of curriculum, we need to think about what do we need to disrupt in that infrastructure as well, in the hierarchies that are established, in the ways that people get promoted or get to have get to be acknowledged based on a system that is not necessarily um, inclusive. You know, Sheila, I think that you maybe partially answered the question I had put up next. Um, and this is for you and for Jennifer, but um, one of our attendees, Jennifer Marlowe asks, if we're trying to create an anti-racist writing program, does that mean that we should get rid of the grammar handbook? Are grand grammar handbooks inherently a form of white linguistic supremacy? Similarly, uh, D. Sarah Stamps asks, how do professors abide by publishing expectations with the respect to grammar, while at the same time not oppressing um, Black students with white English? I think that, okay, so grammar handbooks are problematic not because they are, well, because they try to standardize and because they are monolithic in their approach to grammar, but they're also problematic because it's like the tail wagging the dog. So instead of education actually deciding what they value in the way of speech or practices, so we have research that can dis rip, disrupt this completely, yet we still have publishers pumping out these grammar guides and people buying them because we've never disrupted what we see, what we expect of our students. So I do think to a large degree, we, the grammar guides are not, one thing that I think is important, and I'll slow down, is that people understand that there is no singular grammar, like there is no singular rhetoric. So it is not a, once you think of something as being monolithic, you exclude all, that, all the other things that were going on outside it. So until people start thinking about grammars, we don't have grammars handbooks. You know, so it's not the handbook it's the pro that's the problem. It's, the, it's um, the ways in which we sort of embed our own um, ideologies within the structure of those handbooks. But I, I'm gonna give Jen time to see. Well, I think it also reinforces this idea that grammar is really like the most important thing to writing, which I think uh, Dr. Carter Todd's presentation showed that that's really not the case. There are many different dimensions of writing we should be thinking about, including relation, re relationality and style and things like this, that you could have a completely grammatically correct essay and have it totally be a flop because it's so boring and it doesn't connect to its audience, right? But still there's this kind of idea like we need to teach grammar and that's like the most important thing. Um, and I think there was the other part to the question I'm trying to remember now that had something to say. Uh, publishing ex expectations. So I'm not sure about what context of publishing the question is coming from, but I think about you know the pub publishing that does happen in different vernacular languages um, in Black language, in Hawaii Creole English, um, academic books and things like that. And so April, ba April Baker Bell's book is, she uses Black language throughout her book and that's a Rutledge published text. Um, also Geneva Smitherman's um, research, oftentimes she uses Black language. And so um, the reality is that in publishing, I'm, I'm sure it's much more, like we see it much more probably in creative writing, um, you know, the reality is people do publish in different kinds of ways using their own uh, vernacular languages. Uh, so there's a question um, that comes off of Alexa's presentation, but I think that it could also maybe be answered by Nikki and by Lamar. Um, but attendee Susan Cummings asks, if you have recommendations for inviting scholars and artists into your classroom without imposing on them, and especially in the instances where you might not have a means to compensate them. 
Well, I'll just say, looking to your PTSA, um, I was near Duke University. They had um, some community grants. Uh, and then I'll pass it off to Lamar and Nikki, if you want to say anything about um, the guest speaking that you have done. Go ahead, Nikki. You, you in? You're muted. I think you're muted. I think you're muted. No, no, Nikki, you're muted. Jen Jenny, can you unmute it? Okay, now I'm unmuted, right? Mm -hmm. And you can hear my dog barking. I think the main thing that, that we're all doing is uh, we do favors. And uh, I do favors, you do favors. We ask for favors. We try to see it. Sometimes uh, money is going to be significant because people have to eat and they have to pay their rent and a number of things like that. But other times, uh, for example, this year, which was so wonderful, I had uh, uh, Renee Watson, who I just think is so such a wonderful YA, uh, and I, I just love, she's a YA writer, and I just love her work. And I just asked why, I asked, you know, Renee, would she come? And of course, I owe, I owe uh, Renee uh, a favor. And when she asked <laughs> for it, when, when uh, she runs the Harlem, uh, the uh, Langston Hughes, then I'd be happy when, whenever we can ever get out of being stuck in the house, not stuck, because actually I'm enjoying it, in the houses, I'll do that. You you trade, you do some trade offs, and, and that's one of the, the things that, that you do. You can't assume that everything is about money. Money is important. I'm not a fool, but there are many, many things that, that you you're not, it's not just money. It's it's we would like for you to come. Would you can you do that? And uh we did uh Lamar was there, uh Gina was there, of course, uh, when we had Tony Morrison and um and my Angelo. And we had, a, it was an incredible, we just asked all of the writers <laughs> to come. And of course you can't, you, you can't even afford to put Tony and Maya on the same stage. I mean, you, you would have been looking at a hundred thousand dollars or so. And so the best thing to do with that was no money. And so nobody got paid, nobody, nobody we, and, and it avoided a lot of uh, confusion because then if, if you know that nobody's getting paid then you don't have a, a, an argument about it. And so that was really, uh, I think that was good. But I think you ask people. Sometimes uh, I just got in, in, invited to to do something that I actually cannot do in my uh, my hometown. I'm, I'm from Knoxville, and the young lady wrote and said, you know, she would really like for for me to come and and work with her group. I really can't do it because I'm tired and I'm 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 way behind on everything. And so the answer to that is, I'm sorry, no, because sometimes you have to. You do, you have to say no. I try to say yes to everything. Uh, and I think some of you who know me know that. I do, I try to say yes, but after a while you just realize you're an old woman and you <laughs> you just can't, can't do it. You just have to say, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at the end of my, my rope here. And, and, and so you do that. But I think it's always good to ask, mm -hmm. right? The person, all you can, because all the, and, and all of us have heard no before ask whoever you want and whatever you want them and don't you know do the bullshit don't do the you know i've always loved you since i was two years old and <laughs> none of that you know you write and ask them what they, just just be honest about it so so that people can respond in in the best way that they can you know what i yeah the only thing i will add is that you know of course when when nikki asks you to do anything you say yes but um um <laughs> uh because she's so generous um uh, and and everybody did come because the, the 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 gift of being able to say thank you is the greatest gift ever. And I think if you can find a way, um, sometimes they're like um, local councils, as Alexa said in her presentation. Who, will, if you can be proactive right now and know that you want to do this, um, find um, the wow. you know your local city council or they, they've always got an arts fund that they're probably under mm -hmm. under using, and so even if it's only 50 bucks or whatever it might be, um, know that for your, for your city, for your state um, mm -hmm. and, and apply and then give them, you know, the big dreams. Like I want to bring X, Y, Z person uh, to justify the amount of money that you want. The other thing I was going to uh, say um, particularly um, is know your alumni. Um, know the people who have graduated from your school. I think the, the one of the things that I've learned being from the town that I'm from uh, is how short 
the memory is of these communities um, when they want to be. And particularly when you're trying to do anti-racist practice, if you've been somebody who has come from a place um, where you stirred up trouble, like I've always been a troublemaker, people want to forget about you, right? Um, and so there are already those people who are probably, who have institutional memory of the, of the, of the place that you're teaching in. Um, and you have to seek out those alumni and find out how many of them would be more than willing to come back and share whatever their expertise of knowledge might be. And when you're being creative, you can find a way to connect it to whatever your students need. Um, and they will see that connection and appreciate it. I think knowing someone who's been in the calls that they've been in and walked the, through the, the locker rooms that they've walked, walked through is as important as getting to meet, you know, um, Nick Giovanni, you know, well, maybe not as important, but you know, someone that is and an, 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 um, seems intangible to them, seems too too big for them. Um, if, if it's someone that they really feel like that has been where they've been. So that's one thing I would say, if you don't have a lot of money, start with your alumni. It also sounds like I'm hearing um, being very intentional about the relationships that are getting built, not just the professional ones, but the personal ones. And that also seems to resonate so strongly with checking in with yourself, like Gina saying, having an understanding like Alexa's uh, presentation reiterated over and over again, knowing why you're doing this work, knowing why you wanna bring student, like these speakers and these artists into your space and share them with your students, not because you feel obligated, but because you're trying to build something curricularly. Um, and we, we know that education has been a source of structural harm, but it could also, you know, like we're trying to address that. Um, so it seems like relationships and your own relationship to why you're trying to do the work is so important. Um, so we're just about out of time, but I have one more question. If we can rock and roll just for a couple more minutes, I, I um, would love to hear what some people on the panel. Um, so... It's a general question. It's not towards um, anyone in particular, but Allison Craig asks, how can I light a fire under the administration, uh, university administration to hire more black indigenous people of color faculty? My uni recently held a diversity and inclusion forum that focused almost exclusively on curriculum, even though we have a very diverse student body and a largely white faculty. When I push about hiring, I get the it's the pool racist excuse. I'm contingent, so I don't have much weight to throw around. Any strategies that you can recommend? And similarly, um, or, or relatedly rather, uh, attendee Catherine Flowers asks, um, what do the panelists, uh, I'm wondering what the panelists have to say about racism within English departments. How has our own discipline contributed to racism and other limited ideas of what counts as knowledge, literacy, art, et cetera? In other words, what do we make of the fact that English departments may perpetuate racism more than they disrupt it? So I think those are two sides of an interesting coin. How can we bring more BIPOC faculty into our spaces, but also what spaces are we bringing them into? Okay, I think one of the things in terms of talking about bringing in people. Okay, so first you have to dismiss the myth that there aren't any people out there that can do this job, right? Mm -hmm. So you do this by going to, you get the peer institution, you find the statistics, you find out who has been hiring whom. What, what number of people came out in that discipline that you know are other places? So, so there is, there's a huge myth about our pool wasn't diverse because nobody wants to come here. We are in Blacksburg, you know, and our pool comes to us from time to time, you know. So you have to sort of, you, first you just confront that myth. The other way is, is if you can't take it on as contingent faculty, and I do absolutely understand that, you tie it into the mission of the university. What have you all stated as a priority? If you've stated something as a priority and the research shows that that priority has to be reinforced not only curricularly, but also by representation, then they have to do what they're saying. Because you're saying, okay, so here you're saying this and here you're saying this. You point out their inconsistencies and then have the research to show how those inconsistencies can be bridged and corrected. And I'm done. I have to agree with Dr. Carter Todd's point about, you know, demystifying, you know, throwing out that idea that there aren't people available. Um, I think there's also a lot of research out there about hiring practices and bias in the hiring practice, as well as strategies for making your search more inclusive that people, um, you know, could be looking at. Um, if you're in a more vulnerable position as I think it was contingent faculty, mm -hmm. 
Um, you might think about building relationships with folks who are in positions of more institutional power and kind of, you know, let, speaking to them about what your concerns are. And sometimes they might be willing to kind of um, speak up when they're able to do so um, about these issues. And does anyone want to talk about what I attached on <laughs> as secondary or in addition to that question about what kind of spaces are we bringing Black, Indigenous, people of color, faculty, staff workers, um, instructors, students sometimes? Like sometimes we recruit students, right? And um, how can we be um, uh, reflexive and honest about the spaces we're bringing them into? Well, you know, I'll say on one level, indeed, you know, when you're talking about a university, you're talking about an institutional structure that that replicates the same type of systemic racism that we talk about from all angles. But I think one strategy, and as simple as this may sound, is that I as an individual do it every day that I walk into the classroom and I teach the material that I teach and I engage with students. I mean, and I think we have to do that on the, on the very individual level in our classrooms. This is what I'm saying in the teaching of literature, the types of texts that we teach, we have to show students that there are different narratives and there are different things which confront them um, because they are part of that institution. We like to talk about the institution as this um, you know, amorphous entity, but the institution is made up of individuals and those individuals are a part of the change. I think the momentum, as we'll say, that's happening now with the Black Lives Matter movement, with white allies who are now entering the movement, I think, again, indicated by Lamar's film, when the gaze now, the oppositional gaze is about not looking at others, but looking at yourself, how we teach those students, how we present this information to people is about that change that then has them to take that reflexive look and think about the ways in which they can be anti-racist and the ways in which they can create a culture and environment that actually feels welcoming and that feels like a space in which people of color, gender non-conforming, indigenous people, you know, everyone can feel a part. So I think it starts on that small level and we have to stop thinking about the institution as this amorphous, you know, entity yeah. that isn't made up of individuals and yeah. beings. And maybe not start with them, maybe not start with the institution, right? Which is also sounds like is part of your answer. Lamar? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just wanted to say amen, that's all. <laughs> yeah. Would anyone else like to add to that? Okay, well, I, I would like to start wrapping us up. Um, I do have a list of thank yous that I just need to get to. Um, so if you could all bear with me. Um, uh, thank you for everyone who stayed through to the end of our webinar. Um, we're really glad to host you. And uh, this, like I said at the beginning, this webinar will be um, archived with the Virginia Tech Special Collections and University Archives. Um, so we're going to work on that. And that's going to include the materials you saw tonight. And we're especially going to work with the transcripts that are going to get archived in addition to the video. So. Um, for reading accessibility and accuracy of the message itself. Um, I'd also like to thank Dean Belmonte and the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, the Virginia Tech English Department, the Diversity Committee, which is made up of my um, fellow colleagues, Katie Carmichael, Justin Green, Shelley Maycock, and myself, Silas Casanelli. Thank you to Brian Gaines who, for creating our event yeah. flyer. Um, appreciate it. Uh, to our presenters this evening, Nikki Giovanni, L. Lamar Wilson, Gina Chandler-Smith, Katie Carmichael, Sheila Carter-Todd, Jennifer Sano-Franchini, and Alexa Garfield. <laughs> thank you very much for your participation. We have a number of moderators and participants who helped us out to not only make sure that this event happened, but also have been doing the behind the scenes work during this webinar, which made it run incredibly smooth. Um, and that uh, thanks goes to Ginny Fowler, Justin Green, Shelley Maycock, Ashley Reed, Kat Gray, and Taisha Thompson. So thank you for being all over the chat and the Q&A and the Google Docs that have been dropped in um, and the accessibility scripts. Uh, thank you to Telos, which is the Technology Enhanced Learning and Online Strategy Center and the VT Media Relations, um, including Eve Traeger, Daniel Yaffe, Jordan Pfeiffer, and Paula Byron. 
And then finally, um, you know, special thank you to the VT Special Collections and University Archives for knowing or um, letting us know in advance that this that could be the home for this uh, particular recording. Uh, we really appreciate it and we look forward to adding this to a public community archive, um, which anyone can access, uh, not just researchers and not just those who are part of the VT community. Um, so if anyone has any questions, are looking for uh, follow-up information, um, my email, smooncass at vt.edu has been all over all of your <laughs> announcements. Please feel free to reach out to me and I will put you in touch with whomever, um, answer your questions, offer up resources. Thank you very much. I hope you all have a lovely evening and we'll say goodbye. <laughs>